This is a Linux kernel power management 101 kind of training. Uh, there was some of the concepts covered in this training was already covered in a training yesterday in, in more depth. So some of it is just a repeat. Uh, we somehow got the sessions reversed. Um, apart from that, uh, so th this training is meant to be a peripheral view on a lot of power management features that are available in Linux kernel today. Uh, it doesn't deep dive into any of these frameworks, and it is more from a device driver or a device point of view on what device drivers should do to adapt to most of these frameworks. Okay, so let's start with why do we need power management? Power management is needed in order to reduce energy consumption, which in turn will reduce your cooling requirements, which in turn will reduce heat, heat dissipation, which saves money, which saves environmental impact of your system, which improves system stability. And in case of mo mobile devices or embedded devices, it also gives better battery performance. So given all this, what, what is the goal of power management? It is to consume as little power as possible in a given system state for a use case or for a configuration. And as the SOCs have evolved and become more and more complex, these solutions have also evolved in Linux kernel. And there, are a, there are a bunch of frameworks today that exist in the kernel that deals with power management. Moving on, power management in the kernel can be classified into two. Uh, static power management versus dynamic power management. So static power management is more like uh, how to save power when the system has been inactive for long periods of time. Uh, for example, in case of laptop, if the laptop has been idle for 30 minutes or an hour, what to do with all the devices, what to do with the entire system in order to maximize power saving. Um, in case of a phone, it is probably pressing the power off button, what, what to do in that case. Uh, the status of the frameworks pertaining to static power management in Linux kernel uh, is quite evolved. They have been there for quite some time. There is some maintenance activity still ha happening on those frameworks, but there is no major active development happening on those frameworks. Uh, on the other hand, there is dynamic power management, which deals with how to configure devices in the system when the system is in an active state, when there is some use case running. Uh, or when there are short pulses of inactivity between these use cases or tasks. And the frameworks that deal with uh, dynamic power management in the kernel, the state, they are still evolving as the, as the systems evolve and as the complexities of the SOCs evolve. These frameworks are also evolving and adapting and there's quite a lot of churn happening on some of these frameworks. So the um, static power management framework in generically in the, in the Linux kernel, it's known as suspend resume framework. Uh, so like, like I mentioned, it, it deals with uh, what to do when the system has been inactive for a long period of time. And typically, the suspend is triggered on the system through a user activity. Like on the phone, it is pressing of the but button. So how it triggers when when there is a user activity, you can write into the particular sysfs file, syspower state, and depending on the various values returned to it, different actions are taken in the system in order to trigger the suspend framework. So, in, so there are various levels of suspend possible, but generically for any kind of, if a suspend framework is triggered, the first things that get done are freezing of the user space tasks, suspending timekeeping, and putting most of the IO devices in low power or deep idle states. And then depending on the value that is written into the sysfs file, um, various other decisions are taken. So there is suspend to idle, which is triggered by writing freeze into syspower state. So this is the suspense state probably with the minimal latency, as in it takes the minimal amount of time to go into the state and probably to resume out of the state. Um, and in this state, in addition to doing all the generic steps, the system also puts all the CPUs into the deepest C state possible, CPU idle state possible. Uh, there is power on suspend, which is triggered by writing standby into the sysfs file. Uh, in this state, 
in addition to doing all the generic steps, all the non-boot CPUs are off, taken offline, and the boot CPU is put in the deepest idle state possible. There is the ne next uh, suspend state that is possible is suspend to RAM, uh, which is triggered by writing mem into uh, syspower state. Uh, so in, in this state, in addition to the generic steps, the internal memory of the system, this RAM, is put into self-refresh. Uh, the non-boot CPUs are taken offline, and the boot CPU is powered off. And then there is this last possible state, which is called suspend to disk, and it is triggered by writing disk into the sysfs file. And it is commonly known as hibernate. It is not so prevalent on the uh, embedded devices or IoT devices. It is more prevalent on desktop and laptop devices. So in this case, a snapshot of the system is saved into a persistent storage, like a hard disk or a EMMC. Uh, and then everything is shut down. The system is powered down. Memory is powered down. System is shut down. Uh, the difference here is that when you wake up, when you boot up, uh, at some point during the boot up, uh, the saved image is loaded back, and the system starts running uh, from the point it got shut down from. Uh, there is a lot of complexity in, evo involved in it at the back end, but this is what it does at the broad level. OK. Uh, so again, so like I said, so we'll go through it like depending on what device drivers are supposed to do. And I don't know why this slide is like this. OK. Anyways, uh, so device drivers are supposed to register certain device hooks uh, in order to trigger, in order to be called during the system suspend and resume. Uh, the important ones here are the prepare, um, the resume, and the suspend. So these gets these are the device specific hooks. There are platform specific hooks which can be which are defined as well. So during the suspend sequence, first a platform hook is called, which in turn will call all the device hooks that are registered. And these device hooks are supposed to specify the steps that your particular device is supposed to take when you are shutting down the system and when you are resuming back the system. Now, once the system is suspended, how, how, how to wake up? It's usually a user-triggered activity, like a swipe on the touch screen or a mouse event or something like that. And in order to enable the wake up on your de if the device has a wake up, is, has, is wake up capable and it has a wake up source, in order to enable it, there are a few steps the device driver needs to do. First is to let the PM framework know that the device is wake up capable, and that is through the device init wake up. And then the next step is to enable that particular IRQ in the IRQ subsystem. It's like telling the IRQ subsystem that I have a interrupt that is wake up capable. So that is by enable IRQ wake, and then there is a counterpart to it, which is the disable IRQ wake. And once the wake up occurs, the device driver is supposed to notify the PM framework via PM wake up event that the wake up has occurred and do whatever necessary steps need to be done. Um, apart from that, these wake ups can also be enabled and disabled from the user space. So there is uh, every device has a sysfs entry associated with it under sys devices, and under this node, there is the provision to enable and disable the wake up sources via power wake up node. So that is how you can enable or disable wake up from the user space. Yeah, I think there is a mic somewhere there. Does it apply for all the methods you presented before? I mean, for free, for the freeze method, for the mem, for the standby? Uh, yes, yeah. it does. Uh, it does apply for freeze and mem and standby. Yes, it okay. does. Okay, so if I freeze. This method will be called also. If you freeze, yes. If, if you have enabled the wake up on your device, yes. You, you have to enable it via these steps, yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, not for suspended disk. Suspended disk is like shutting down the system. Yeah, but yeah. For, for, yeah, definitely. But for freeze and mem and everything else, yes. So user space can actually disable all the devices from triggering a wake up using the SysFS nodes? User space can enable or disable the wake up. So that, I, that just tells the PM framework whether your device is wake up capable or not. But then uh, the devices internally, once, once, this is, once the command is triggered from the SysFS, the device driver has to run with it. Device driver has to say, okay, fine, I'm going to go and enable or disable the particular interrupt in the interrupt framework. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, let's move on. Yeah, so we'll move on to dynamic power management. So like I said, it is use case based power management. So the system is running some things, so there's a use case running, there are some tasks running. So how best to configure the system to achieve the uh, maximum power savings possible. Uh, there are a bunch of frameworks that deals with dynamic power management, CPU frec, dev frec, OPP framework, Gen PD framework, runtime PM framework, clock framework, regulator framework. So we'll, we'll probably do a peripheral review of some most of these frameworks, at least. Okay, before, okay. so let's prob possibly start with this slide before the other slide. Uh, so um, the, the dynamic power management can again be classified into active power management and Mm, idle power management. So active power management is the device is actually being used in a use case So how and how best to configure the device in order to achieve uh, the perf required performance with maximum power saving. And then there is this concept of OPP or operating performance points. There's nothing but um, a device can op possibly operate at different frequencies and there can be different voltages associated with these frequencies. So a pair of this frequency and voltage is called an operating performance point or OPP. Different SOCs name it differently, but then in Linux kernel it is known as um, OPP. Uh, so there can be multiple OPPs associated with a device and uh, these OPPs are usually defined in a device tree on a per device basis. So if you look at the DT entries for the devices that have uh, different operating points, you will see the OPPs uh, defined in the device tree. Uh, and this and the kernel has a OPP framework which kind of deals with OPPs for various devices and this forms the backend for the active power management which is also called DVFS or dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So dynamic voltage and so the idea behind dynamic voltage and frequency scaling is um, a device need not probably operate at the a device can operate at different frequencies and a device probably need not operate at the uh, highest frequency always. Even when it is participating in a use case, uh, it, in order to meet the performance requirement, it probably need not operate at the highest frequency. It can operate at a lower frequency, which in turn means that the voltage can also be lowered, and which is what typically gives the power saving. So, the CPU FREC is the framework that deals with DVFS for CPUs. Uh, and the idea is to select the best OPPs for a CPU, depending on, based on constraints and requirements. And the entity that provides these constraints and requirements is known as a governor. The governor, based on a set of criteria, decides which OPP or operating performance point a CPU should be put into. Uh, there are a bunch of governors that already exist in the um, kernel today. So there is the performance governor which always puts performance ahead and always chooses an OPP which gives the maximum performance. Uh, there is power save governor which puts the, whose criteria is saving power and always chooses an OPP that maximizes power saving. Uh, apart from that, there is user space governor, which allows for OPPs to be dictated from the user space. Uh, 
there is on demand governor which is which was probably used as the which was the most commonly used governor till some years ago and um, the idea here there is to uh, look at the load of a CPU for deciding the operating performance point of the CPU. So depending on the load, the OPPs are scaled up or scaled down in a stepwise fashion. It also gives a lot of knobs to control how to step the OPPs up and step the OPPs down, and how often to look at the load and stuff like that. Uh, finally, there is Schedutal, which is a more recent Development and Schedutal is the governor today used in most of the ARM-based systems, uh, or, or at least we try to use it in most of the ARM-based systems. And uh, the idea why it was developed was if CPU load is a, is a criteria for dictating the OPP of a CPU, the best place to do that is probably the scheduler. And then, um, so scheduler, Schedutal considers the scheduler load and several other parameters and then chooses the OPP for a CPU. Uh, regarding CPU FREC driver, every platform can define a driver for, the, for enabling CPU FREC, but most of the ARM based platforms today use the driver CPU FREC DT.C uh, to trigger the CPU FREC. And similar to CPU FREC, there is Dev FREC, which is DVFS for uh, d devices, and which allows to select the best OPP for devices based on certain constraints and requirements that comes from, again, governors. And there are governors, again, for Dev FREC, like on demand and performance and power save. It's a very similar concept associated for devices. <coughs> We did this. Yeah, so moving on to the idle power management part of dynamic PM. So here, the like I mentioned, the idling, there is the, it caters to periodic idling between tasks, and the range of the idle period is probably milliseconds or microseconds rather than seconds and minutes. So your use case is running, a task is running on a CPU, and there is in between short bursts of idle and what to do in these short bursts with the devices and with the system in general. And the frameworks, the, the CPU idle deals with idling of CPUs. And in order to deal with device idle, there are framework, the, the frameworks are runtime, PM, and gen PD. So we probably covered a bit of, we probably covered a lot of runtime, PM, and generic power domain yesterday. So I'll probably just run, run, run through it today. So CPU idle work, um, works on this concept of C state or CPU idle state. It is an ACPI term. So there are different idle states possible for a CPU. And the, the deeper a C state is, more is the power saving. But more is also the, but there is also a bigger latency associated with entering into that particular state and getting out of that uh, particular state. There can be multiple idle states associated with a CPU. Uh, and these idle states are usually defined in the device tree. So what you see there on the left uh, is an idle state entry on the device from the device tree. Um, so each CPU can have multiple idle states associated with it. Uh, the important entries to notice here are the entry latency, exit latency, and the minimum residency. So entry latency is the latency involved in triggering or entering into that particular CPU idle state. Exit latency is probably the latency associated with coming out of that idle state and restarting regular functioning. And now considering that there is a cost or a latency associated with entering and exiting out of a C state, uh, it probably doesn't make sense to enter a C state unless you are sure that you can remain in that particular C state for a certain duration of time. And that duration is defined as the minimum residency. Um, 
again, there are governors to on which decide how to choose these particular sea states. We'll talk a bit about them in the next slide. And they aid in choosing the CPU idle states for the CPUs. Uh, the, every platform can specify a driver to aid with uh, to define and to pull the CPU idle states from the device tree and to do, do all the bookkeeping work. But then all the driver that is used on the ARM devices, to, on most of the ARM devices today is CPU idle hyphen ARM dot C. Yes. Um, is the entry latency uh, dependent on the clock c of the CPU or the device, whatever is it defined, right? So if you have like one gigahertz CPU currently, in, it will be seven microseconds or... It is not... It's not related to it, the clock No, it rate. is not just related, it is not related to clock per se, it is more related to what all needs to be done to get into that particular. You have to put the work case. Yes, it is oh, not just yes. clock. So yes. it's the lowest clock. Yeah, it oh. is not just clock. It has got a lot of other parameters associated but, with it. But this, it's measured, right? I mean, once you, you define it, you take yeah. the time to understand what's the time. Yes, yes, that is, yes, it. yes. So uh, I'm wondering why the minimum residency can't be calculated just based on entry and exit latency. So we know the entry latency, we know the exit latency, we know how much time it will take to get into idle state and come out of it. Can't we calculate the minimum residency out of it? Mm. Why? You can go ahead. Uh, because it's in, it relies on the previous idle state. It's a trade-off between the the cost to enter and exit the state and the cost of the other idle state. So it's uh, an equation where you measure the time remaining in this state. So, I mean, you, you can be on the previous idle state and, s and consume more energy than this state. There is a trade-off. So it's a, a figure on what you have uh, the... Uh, sorry? Yes, you have the break-even point where you have the idle state of the previous state. So you save less energy, but you take less energy to enter. So the... Um, the, the slope <laughs> is, uh, is lower than the, the other OPP, and then the other OPP is as a cost which is higher, but you save much more energy, so the slope is even uh, more flat. So at the end, both will reach a point, and when you have this point, it's the break-even, and it, it's the target residency. It's, um, you have to see the math, and it's in the wiki page of the poem. But can't we calculate it at runtime? No. 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 I think it took two days to compute a target residency for one state. You can make some measurements and some tests to estimate by doing a lot of measurements with different okay. idle tires, so it take a lot of time. The, the, the numbers here for the oh, sorry. is basically the input for the scheduler or for the... The minimum residency? Yeah. So, the, the, so the, the CPU idle driver uses the re, mm, this residency. The governors use this residency to choose the next possible idle state. So it, it considers these values when when making that decision. Well, I'll probably it's probably I have a slide on what the governors do. It choose, it, there are, yeah, hi, hi, history is considered, but there are other considerations like whether any device has placed a limitation <laughs> saying that I need this latency requirement from the CPU, like, and also considers um, uh, the next timer event and e events like that before making that decision. So, like I said, the um, entity that makes the, um, that has the algorithm that uh, takes the decision on which, 
a C state to choose next. It's called a governor. There are there is menu governor, there is ladder governor, which is typically not used, and there is a, this new governor that has been introduced in 5.1 called timer events oriented governor. It is developed by Intel, I do, but I don't think it is it is more x86 based than ARM based. Daniel, ha have you tested that out? Have, have you tested uh, the TO out on uh, ARM platform? Y yes. It's, um, it's good for us? No. Exactly. So and it, it actually does a lot of uh, prediction, but it's very, um, it's sh shows choosing shallow, shallow, shallow states. states. So over. you have um, a big improvement in terms of performances, but also you have a, an, an, an important energy drop. Okay. So for mobile, we. I mean, it's it's better for for, for desktop. Yeah. Yes, for desktop and server, it's it's okay. But for mobile, it's, it does not suit well. Yeah, makes sense. So, uh, so the frequently used so today the frequently used governor on ARM systems is called menu governor. It chooses the C state to enter based on a few criteria. So the one is, like I said, the latency limitations. So that there is this framework in kernel called quality of service framework that allows devices to stipulate that I need a particular performance or a particular, uh, I have a particular latency limitation on a CPU. So it considers that and compares it with the exit time and the entry time and minimum residency before choosing a C state. Uh, the governor also considers the next predictable event, which are typically timer events in the system. Uh, the idea is that um, let, I know that an event is going to occur after, let's say, at a certain duration. There is no point in choosing an idle state whose minimum residency is more than that particular idle state, because I'm anyway going to come out of it. And whatever power saving I get out of going into that idle state is kind of lost. So, um, and then there is, it considers the CPU load and there are some magic multipliers involved which kind of dictates that, okay, if the CPU load has been high previously, choose a shallower C state. If the CPU load has been uh, low previously, choose a deeper C state. Uh, and there is, so, in order to improve those features, there is something called IRQ prediction that is currently being developed, uh, where the idea is to, instead of uh, predicting the CPU load, to predict the next interrupt event, the next IO interrupt or the interrupt event from a device, uh, and to use that in order to make decisions for a, to choose a C state. Okay, so moving on, there is uh, device idle. Uh, device idle, so it's it's different from the uh, device suspend that happened during static power management. This is only a per device idle. Uh, it is driven from the device driver. Uh, the idea being the device driver is the best entity to know when to uh, idle a device and when to make a device active. It is not triggered from user space, like, unlike suspend. Uh, there is no put, no dependencies taken care of except for the parent-child dependency that is existing in the device driver model or in the device tree. That gets taken care of, but nothing else. And there is no user space fees, free, um, user task freezing or timekeeping freezing or any of that stuff. It is just idling off a particular device, and that's it. Um, yeah, so so the framework that came, one of the frameworks that caters to it is called Runtime PM Framework. Um, so again, we go back to that dev PM op structure that is that I showed you for suspend, and the device driver is supposed the device drivers are supposed to register hooks that are, that needs to be that gets called when a device idle is triggered. The main hooks are runtime suspend, runtime resume, and runtime idle. And once that gets done, whenever the device has to be active, 
the device is supposed to trigger it via PM runtime get, which issues the command to the runtime PM framework, and which in turn will call the runtime resume hook that has been registered by the device driver. And in order to be idle, the device is supposed to call runtime PM runtime put or PM runtime put sync or PM runtime put auto suspend. Uh, so the uh, uh, runtime PM framework internally uses a use count based mechanism. It maintains a use uh, counter on a per device basis. And the, um, well, the idea is that when the use count is zero, it means that there are no more requests for the device to be active. So I go ahead and call the, actually this is, it's not runtime suspend, I go ahead and call the runtime idle, which in turn sometimes get call the runtime suspend to suspend the device based on a certain criteria. And once a runtime suspend is called, the device is supposed to populate the necessary context save and en enable wake-ups and all that in the runtime suspend hooks. Uh, and similarly, when the use count becomes one, it means that there is a request for the device to be active. So uh, trigger the runtime resume of the device, which is supposed to restore context and do any other bookkeeping required to restore the device. So uh, moving on, there is the generic power domain framework. So in hardware, devices can be grouped into power domains depending on uh, devices that can be power gated together can be grouped into power domains. And then in software, the generic power domain framework kind of gives a logical grouping for these devices. It is based on runtime PM. Uh, there is nothing per se that devices are supposed to do except uh, hook into runtime PM properly using the other, using these hooks that was mentioned before. Um, but on the other hand, from a platform point of view, the platform is supposed to define the power domains. And uh, from a device point of view, the device is supposed to define which power domains it belong to in the device tree. So that is what you see on the left. So the first one is a power domain definition, and the second block is a device subscribing to that particular power domain. This is a generic question. What about user space drivers? Is there some framework to enable all this uh, device driver uh, PM for user space drivers? Or Mm. Each one needs to do some kind of kernel module. I, for, for the, are you talking about modules? Because yeah. yeah, I think modules can. Modules. Uh, what kind of benefit? Yeah. Like user space drivers, you want to do some uh, user space driver for, let's say, a NIC or what? What say, whatever device driver you want to do. So, you so user space driver which controls hardware directly. Yeah, yeah. That, so yeah, you don't just. Yeah. So you must have something. You must, have, you must yeah. have something. Uh, yeah. there, right? but, but then kernel modules can always yeah, use it. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah. Uh, what happens if a driver, a device which is part of, of a power domain, has a driver that, that does not define the runtime PM callback, does it stuck, does, does it make impossible to, to go to suspend for the user device? Or? It, it depends. It, it really depends on what happens. If that's, if whether it's a standalone device and that, like for example, let's say there are two devices and in, uh, registered, which belongs to a power domain in the hardware, and one of them subscribes to, one of them has defined the power domain and has done everything correct and there is a runtime framework for it and everything, and the second one does not. So it is quite possible that when the second one has requested for or is active, power, the PM framework goes and puts the power domain into suspend. It turns, shuts down the power domain. Uh, 
it is it is again based on ref count so he the framework doesn't know there is a second ref count so No, if 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 one of the driver if do, does not implement the runtime PM callback. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the whole hierarchy of resources will never get disabled. The clock okay. or experience, the con what the controller yeah. experience, and they will always be enabled. Or get disabled if there is another device that has registered as a device in I that know, power so domain. I, I yeah. Yeah. The driver has done clock enable something. Uh, yeah. 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 So it will never get disabled. Yeah. So yeah. System suspend makes sense. Work. System it doesn't block system suspend, but it will not say power during your time. <coughs> okay, where were we? Okay, yeah. Okay, so again, device drivers per se doesn't have to do anything, but then the platform has to uh, register all the power domains um, that are present from uh, pull it out of the device tree and register them using PM Gen PD in it. And a platform is supposed to define power off, power and power on hooks in order to power off and power on a, a generic power domain. And we'll talk about set performance state hook a little later. So yeah, so like I mentioned, it's based on uh, runtime PM and uh, use, use counter. Um, so the uh, idea is when all the devices in a particular domain are runtime suspended, the runtime framework knows that all the devices are suspended. So he, the framework in turn goes and triggers the generic power domain framework to power off that particular power domain. Similarly, if a single device that has been in the power domain request to be runtime resumed, the framework knows that uh, the power domain also needs to be turned on and the frame, runtime framework issues the command to turn on the power domain. And these calls of into power on and power off comes into the platform specific power on and power off, which was registered here. And that is where the platform specific code resides and whatever your platform needs to do to turn on and turn off the power, power domain needs to be done there. Okay, so th this, this is kind of confusing because this deals still, at this point it all deals with idling of the power domains. But apart from this, a power domain, e even when active, can have different levels of operation. It could be different clock levels of operation, where different <coughs> frequencies in which it can run it, and stuff like that. So in order to deal with that, there is something called dev PM gen PD set performance state that allows a performance state or a level at which the uh, power domain has to perform it to be defined. And that is what the set performance state in this hook that a platform, and for the, the platform specific hook for it is the set performance state. It's not really the idle, idle, power, it's not idle power management, it is more of an active power management feature, but it is part of Gen PD module. And also today, I, th I think it's a, it's a more recent development where Gen PD governors allow you to um, def provide per device quality of service constraints or latency constraints, which kind of uh, rolls back into whether a power domain can actually be powered down or power should be kept on. Any questions before we move on to quality of services? Do we have time? We don't. What's that? Ten more minutes. Okay. Okay. So moving on, quality of service. I'll, I'll just skim through this, and I don't know if needed. We'll do thermal management. Otherwise, no. Uh, so. Uh, the kernel allows for qu the kernel has a quality of service framework that allows for two classes of quality of services to be defined. One is system wide 
constraints and the other one is device specific constraint. So the system wide constraint is what, so the system wide constraints, there are multiple, so a few of them are CPU, DMA latency constraint, network latency constraint, network throughput constraint, etc. The CPU DMA latency is the one that is widely used and it kind of tr goes back into the CPU, feeds back into the menu governor in the uh, CPU idle framework, which is one of those parameters that allows the menu governor to choose the C state. So if a device has said that I need a particular latency from the CPU, the menu governor picks it up and uses it to make the choice. Uh, similarly, there is this uh, associated with the generic power domain framework. There is device specific uh, quality of service that can be specified, which is uh, dev PMQ, uh, QoS resume latency and dev PMQoS latency tolerance. Good question. The, the memory, like the PMQoS memory bandwidth, is that hooked up to like bus scaling or something? Or do you know how that's implemented? No, it's not we will probably should do yeah. something that for another reason we probably need to register the DeFi for that to scale it. Okay. Do you want to do thermal management? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I thought a lot on how to organize this. So again, this is a little deviation from the generic format of the training. It, uh, so device drivers and devices don't have to do anything much with thermal management generically, unless you are a sensor driver or a cooling device driver. Um, but it's more from a system point of view. So the thermal management frameworks, it's on, can itself be divided into four, the thermal zones, thermal sensors, the cooling devices, and thermal governors. So a thermal zone, as far as the hardware is concerned, is a zone or an area or a device in an SOC that has a thermal constraint, like a processor or a GPU. Uh, so typically, a zone will have sensors associated with it to sense the hot points and to report the temperature changes. And it could also have active cool, cooling devices like a fan associated with it uh, from the hardware point of view. From how, how this has got mapped into the Linux kernel software framework is a zone is represented as a device driver and it's treated as a manager for all the thermal activity pertaining to that zone. So if you look at the picture here, uh, the thermal zone device driver is what interacts with each and every entity of the, uh, the thermal zone, like the sensor driver, the thermal governor, the cooling device driver, and it kind of acts as a manager. So it's, it's a, it's, it's, it can be considered as a, uh, what you say, it can be considered as an entity that kind of passes messages between these various pieces of the uh, thermal framework. So then there are thermal sensors, which are actual I2, from a hardware point of view, these are actual I2C ADC converters or band gap devices that has the ability to sense the device hot points, to sense interrupts, I mean to sense temperatures and to issue interrupts to notify the, um, about the temperature changes. And from a software point of view, there is a, usually a device driver associated with each of these sensor uh, devices, um, and these device drivers often defines the trip points for these hardware interrupts, as in at each, uh, and it also defines the range of temperature for these trip points. Then there are cooling devices, which, so once you have a thermal activity, once the device is already, or a zone, or a device, or whatever it is, is already heated up, uh, what to do. So there are these cooling devices that aids in power dissipation uh, to control or limit the overheating of the device. So there, are, there can be uh, hardware cooling devices like fans, which just sit there and work, and like you don't have to do anything much other than just turning it on. And there can be a bunch of things that can be 
done in the software to control to in order to aid the cooling of a device. So in case of generic devices, you can always restrict the device performance or restrict the device OPP. You can always say that I will not allow the device to run at the highest OPP or the second highest OPP. I'll bring it down till the device cools. Uh, in case of CPU, it is called CPU FREC cooling device. Uh, again, in case of CPU overheating, you can always decide to hot plug a few CPUs out of the system. Uh, another mechanism is to forcibly idle a few CPUs, inject idle cycles into a few CPUs till the uh, CPUs cool down. So these are all a few software cooling devices that are available in Linux kernel today. And again, there is a governor, which is the entity. It's only a software entity. It's like an algorithm that manages all these devices. It is an algorithm that chooses, OK, that kind of make, takes the decision on uh, what to do, what cooling device to trigger, and what to do when a particular, when the temperature has either risen above a particular point or when the temperature has come down from that particular point. So the the. The governor on, on the main line today is usually is usually stepwise governor, which kind of um, th tries to step up and step down the temperature, which kind of tries to take a stepwise approach to temperature control. And then there is there are governors that can consider power budget and performance requirements. It's called I IPA, which is commonly used in the and Android platform. There can also be user space governors, which controls all this from the user space. You can write policies for it from the user space. I think this is it. Yeah. So this presentation was originally like a few connects ago was derived from a presentation that Kevin Hillman did um, at Bay Libre. So this is the link to the original presentation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>